Welcome to our 2024 scholarship virtual session. I'm Michelle Foster, president and CEO of the Greater Canal Valley Foundation, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this session. Thank you for showing up to learn about free money. You know, you can't beat that. But we are a, as you may know, we are a community foundation uh, based in Charleston, and we have over a million dollars in scholarships that we can award to students statewide. So we've got all these different scholarship funds that are available to students and they are they have different criteria. So this evening we're gonna you're, you'll hear about that. We also have our partner from the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission with us to give you some general information about FAFSA and all that fun stuff. But I just want to welcome you, and I'll just pass it over to our scholarship program officer, Katie Farrell. Katie? Hello, everyone. As Dr. Foster said, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I will be, the way that this evening is going to work is I will be presenting after Brian Weingart. Uh, Brian is one of our greatest allies and can, um, partners in collaboration here at the foundation. And he represents a lot, a lot of statewide um, financial aid opportunities. So Brian, if you are good to go, I'm going to pass the baton to you and let you present. Great, uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Weingart. I'm Senior Director of Financial Aid with the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission. I'll uh, just be giving an overview uh, of the financial aid process and the different financial aid programs that are available both at the federal and the state level and some other resources uh, that help you through this process. So as you go through the financial aid process, uh, just be aware of the different applications that you do need to complete. Uh, obviously, the FAFSA is the main application. Uh, FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Uh, normally, the FAFSA will become available October 1st of each year, and that will be the case next year. Uh, but because they've made a lot of major changes to the FAFSA, uh, it didn't become available until December 31st uh, for 2024-2025. Um, and so just be aware, uh, it is a new form they're going through, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the changes to that uh, FAFSA form. But be aware of the different other applications that you do need to complete. So the Promise application requires both the FAFSA as well as a Promise application. Western Invest, which is our free community college in West Virginia, requires both the FAFSA and a separate application. Um, be aware colleges might require a separate application for their own institutional scholarships. Uh, and so if you want to get a college scholarship, uh, just ask the colleges uh, what their application is and what their deadline is. Um, and of course, private scholarships, uh, which is a huge uh, component uh, of financial aid uh, is the private resources that are out there, uh, whether it's through the, uh, the Greater Canal Valley Foundation or employers. Um, and I'll go over a little bit about that a little bit later on, but they all have their own separate applications, their own deadlines. So you want to be aware of those. So first things first, uh, the first thing you want to do as part of the financial aid process, if you haven't already, is create what's called a federal student aid ID. Uh, they're changing that to an account username password. So it'll still be the same if you've created in the past. Uh, they're just changing the naming convention of it uh, to account username password uh, that used to be called an FSA ID. Um, and this is going to be your electronic signature. Uh, you need one for the student, um, one for the parent, and possibly both parents in some situations. Um, both parents might need the FSA ID. And so it's important that you create that first because uh, you do have to have that completed um, and created at least three to five days prior to starting the FAFSA. Uh, that's different. In the past, you've been able to create as part of the FAFSA process. Uh, it changed this year to where now you need to have it created prior to starting the FAFSA. And it be your social security number be verified with the social security administration um, before you start the FAFSA. So just be aware of that. Um, and you do need it every year um, in order to sign the FAFSA, as well as to sign promissory notes. If you take out any student loans or parent loans, uh, you would need that uh, account username, password, um, or FSA ID. So the FAFSA itself doesn't have a deadline. And so just be aware you can fill out the FAFSA at any point in the course of the year. Uh, but specific programs do have deadlines. Um, and so while you can fill out the FAFSA at any, at any point, uh, during the academic year. Um, be aware, Promise, we just extended our deadline um, for this year to May 1st. Um, so for Promise, you need to file both the Promise application and the FAFSA by May 1st. 
our West Virginia State Grant, or it's also known as the West Virginia Higher Education Grant. Uh, the deadline was April 15th. We've extended that to May 1st. Um, we've done that this year just because of the issues with the FAFSA and some of the things, um, issues uh, where they've rolled out the FAFSA. Um, and I'll, again, I'll go over that here in a little bit. Uh, the West Virginia Invest Grant has a rolling application process, but do we try to get you to fill out both the FAFSA and the Invest application by April 15th, but you can fill out after the April 15th um, is just a priority deadline. So before I move on, uh, this is just a screenshot of, of the new uh, FAFSA. And so when you go to studentaid.gov or fafsa.gov, when you complete the 2024-2005 FAFSA, you'll notice on here that they're blue. Um, so if they're blue, that means that the application is available and you can fill it out. Um, you will notice at some points uh, here, especially early in the process, those might be grayed out. It's nothing that you've done. It's nothing wrong with your computer. But because of the newness of the new FAFSA and the, the changes they're having to make in order to fix bugs in the system, they're taking it down quite a bit. Um, and so they will grave it out. Uh, those buttons where it says start new form, it'll be grayed out if it's not available. I know specifically for today and tomorrow, the FAFSA will be available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. today and tomorrow. Um, but from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., over the course of the night, they're going to gray that out and it won't be available while they make uh, maintenance uh, and fixes uh, to the new FAFSA. So just be aware they're going to take it up and down. Hopefully they'll give us notice of when it's available, when it's not available. Um, and so just be aware and just be patient with the process because it is totally new and there's going to be some bugs they're going to have to fix. And because of that, they're going to have to take it down. Having said that, they are not going to process any FAFSAs at least until the beginning of February. So there's no rush in order to do it immediately. Uh, we've never said that before. Um, usually it's always you want to fill out as soon as possible. Um, but because of the situation, um, it's okay to wait. And so they, what they've been, U.S. Department of Education has indicated to us is usually the first half of January, they're going to take it down quite frequently as they identify issues uh, with the FAFSA application um, and try to try and fix those as quickly as possible. And so just be aware, first couple of weeks here in January, um, take your time, right? Um, if you want to get in there, be patient. You, there's a waiting room now. And so during high volume times, uh, there's a waiting room they'll put you in until the volume has decreased to allow people to get, go into the FAFSA so you guys don't crash the system. Um, and so be aware of the waiting room. Be aware if it's grayed out and you won't be able to access it. I would recommend, you know, maybe waiting to mid-January or even later part of January before trying to fill it out. Um, just so you don't get frustrated um, <laughs> and hit your head against the wall, you know, um, because it might be a frustrating process as they're trying to fix things. So having said that, um, as you go through it, they have tried to simplify it. Um, one of the things that has stayed the same uh, is the dependency status questions. Um, and so the, these determine whether uh, you're independent or dependent. Uh, so when I say dependent, um, if you answer no to all these questions, that means you're a dependent student and you're required to put parents' information on the FAFSA. And so are you 24 years old? Are you a graduate professional student? Are you married as the day you fill out the FAFSA? Do you have legal dependents or children that provide more than half of financial support to? Both parents deceased, veteran, active duty, military. Um, I will say National Guard does not qualify as active duty unless you've been called up for purposes other than training. Um, so be aware of that if you're in National Guard. Uh, if you've been in foster care um, at any time since age 13, um, or if you're um, assigned legal guardianship to someone other than your biological parents, or if you're homeless or an accompanied youth, if you answer yes to any of those questions, then you're independent and you do not have to put parents' information on the FAFSA. But if you answer no to all those questions, you're required to put parents' information on the FAFSA. Um, and so just be aware this hasn't changed, um, but be aware of those questions. Uh, family size. Uh, and so this is a little bit different. Uh, and so when you go into the FAFSA, they're going to try um, estimate what your family size is. Um, family size is going to be estimated based on the number of exemptions you claimed on your federal tax return in 2022. It'll ask you if that number is different. Um, and they will then go ahead and estimate based on the student and the parents. Um, and so you'll indicate before you get to family size whether the parents are married or not married. And they will estimate the parents and the students. So they will guess how many in the household. And then if you have other dependents other than the parents and the student, you're filling the fast file, you would then add that. Um, and so just be aware of that family size is a little tricky in terms of the way they've worded it. Um, and so just watch that. 
when we talk about parents, I'll, I'll deal with the parents first. Um, and so when you're dealing with the parents and who fills out the FAFSA, in the past, it's been who the student lives with most. Uh, that has changed. It is now the parent that provides the majority of the financial support to the student. Okay. And, then, and then whoever that parent is, if that parent is single, then it would just be that parent. Um, so if they're separated, divorced, or single, it's just the one parent that, this, that provides the majority of the support to that student. If the parent is remarried, uh, then it's the parent and step parent. And they, this is based on the day the student fills out the FAFSA. Okay. And so even if the parents were just, the parent was just remarried here this past summer, even though you're using 2022 income information when filling out the FAFSA, it's going to be based on the parent's marital status the day you fill out the FAFSA. Okay. Uh, so to determine first if there's a divorce or separation, the biological or adoptive parent that provides the majority of the financial support, if that parent is then remarried, is the parent and step parents information that goes on the FAFSA. Okay. So as you go in and start answering questions about the parent, that's the parent you put. It is role-based. And so if you've done the FAFSA in the past, it automatically kind of transitioned from the student section over to the parent section. That has changed to where it's now role-based. So the student will do their section first. They will then invite the parents, uh, the parent or parents, whether the parent's married or not married. Um, and then the parent will get an email um, to then log in and fill out the parent portion uh, of the FAFSA. So they're now totally separate applications that the student accesses and then the parent accesses, accesses and then they'll merge that information on the back end. Um, so it is role-based. The situation into, again, you'll be using 2022 tax information. If the parents did not file the same tax return in 2022, then both parents will need to sign and access the FAFSA and sign off on it, giving consent for the IRS to release tax information. Um, so be aware in some cases, if you did not file married jointly um, and, and you are married, both parents will need an FSA ID uh, and will have to go in and give consent um, for their tax return to be released, information to be released um, on the back end to populate the FAFSA. If you have questions as we go through this, please uh, enter uh, the question into the chat um, and I'll stop and answer that question uh, if you have something as I'm going through it. Number of post-secondary education. So if you have more than one in college uh, for the 2024-2025, um, they're going to ask you that question, but it's not uh, calculated in calculating your eligibility for financial aid. So if you will have more than one in college next year, uh, one apology uh, for having two in college at the same time. But second is you want to contact the financial aid offices to see if you would qualify for what's called a special circumstance or professional judgment. Uh, and so while they've removed it from calculation, they've given indication to the U.S. Department of Education that colleges may take that into consideration uh, when determining eligibility for financial aid. So again, if you have more than one in college, contact the financial aid office, see if they would make some type of consideration uh, based on that uh, factor. Contributors, you're going to see that uh, phrase a lot as you go through the fast one. And contributor is not someone who provides financially on the to the student's education, it is contributing information to the fast one. Um, so whether it's the student or if the student's married, the student's spouse, if the student's dependent, then it's the parents are all called contributors, uh, which means you're contributing information, it doesn't mean you're contributing financially. So just so you're aware of that term, that's a new term uh, for this year. And then lastly, the student aid index, this is an index number. And so it is used to be called the EFC or the expected family contribution. Now it's going to be called SAI or student aid index. Um, it's basically the same thing. It's just an index number and it's to help determine whether you qualify for need-based financial aid and what types of financial aid you qualify for. Um, but be aware that is a, some, a term you're going to see um, on the results of your FAFSA and on the confirmation page. So once you submit the FAFSA, be aware you'll see that term, student aid index, and that is going to be an index number that helps determine what you qualify for. So one of the new things um, is they're going to be populating the tax information on the back end. In some cases, um, you will have to manually input your tax information, but in most cases, you should not have to manually enter in your 2022 tax information. It should be populating automatically on the back end um, from the IRS. Uh, because of that and the way the IRS uh, wants to um, make sure that your tax information is secure, uh, that you will have to give consent um, to have your IRS tax information released to the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, if you do not provide that consent, then 
and you're not eligible for federal student aid or any type of financial aid. And so one of the key things that within this new FAFSA is both the student and then any other contributors to information on the FAFSA will have to give their consent and grant consent. Even if you did not file taxes in 2022, you still have to grant consent for your tax information, your tax status to be released from the IRS to the U.S. Department of Education. So in a normal year, um, once you submit the FAFSA, it's usually processed within 72 hours and you would get an email to look at what's called the FAFSA submission summary or the results of your FAFSA. This year is a little different. As I mentioned at the beginning, they are not processing any FAFSAs until at least the beginning of February, maybe even later, depending on um, what kind of bugs and errors they're seeing on their system on the back end uh, once they start receiving FAFSAs. Um, so once you submit your FAFSA, it will go to the U.S. Department of Education. They're going to hold it for the month of January. Um, and then come February, they will start processing. And that is when you will start to see um, the email saying that your FAFSA has been processed. That is when they will be sending it to the colleges. Um, and that's also when they'll send it to our office for state financial aid. So once you submit, so that's one of the things, if you go in and you start submitting your FAFSA now, it's not going to be processed till February. Because of that, you will not be able to go back in and make any type of corrections uh, to your FAFSA. Even if it's just as simple as adding another school to your FAFSA, you will not be able to do that until they've processed the FAFSA. Um, so just be aware of that. And as you go through, especially this early in January, you just want to be careful um, because any if you do make a mistake or make an error, that's fine. But you're going to have to wait till February before you can make a correction uh, to that FAFSA. So just be aware of that. But again, if you make a mistake, not a big deal. You can go back in and you can update it and correct the information. Um, and so it's very important that once you do submit the FAFSA, you review that FAFSA submission summary or the results. And in order to do that, you have to log back into the FAFSA website in order to review that FAFSA submission summary to look over all your information, make sure everything processed correctly. Um, and if, again, if there's a mistake or you left something off, you can go back in and correct that. So one of the things uh, that we always encourage people to fill out the FAFSA because of this issue right here is special circumstances of professional judgment. So people tell all me tell me all the time, uh, why well, fill out the FAFSA? I'm not going to qualify for anything. You may not. So everyone qualifies for something, even if it's at least a student loan. Um, so you will qualify for something. Um, but if you don't qualify for any need-based financial aid, you still want to fill out the FAFSA because if something in your um family situation should change. Uh, there's this process called special circumstance for professional judgment to where the, you can submit a form and documentation to the financial aid office at the school you're going to, and they can make adjustments to your FAFSA based on your documented circumstances. So if you go through a marital status change, so if you go through a separation or divorce, if you lose your job, um, if you have a change in employment where you're making less, or if you've made more in 2022 than you're making in 2024, um, if you have a lot of unpaid medical expenses that you're having to pay out of pocket, um, that the financial aid office can take those things into consideration and make adjustments to your FAFSA to reflect your updated uh, situation. So always encourage you to fill out the FAFSA each year. If something should change in your family situation, you can go through this process uh, to where you might qualify for additional financial aid. So just real briefly, um, so once you fill out the FAFSA and it's processed, it goes to the college. The college is going to go through this equation. They're going to take the cost of attendance. They're going to subtract your student aid index in order to get your uh, student need or your eligibility for need-based financial aid. So the cost of attendance is made up of tuition and fees, housing and food, books and supplies, transportation, personal expenses, which can be um, you know, laundry money. Um, transportation is gas money to get back and forth from the school to the home um, and include the cost of a computer, study abroad, um, loan fees, uh, dependent care costs. All these go into the cost of attendance in which you can get financial aid to help cover these costs. Uh, and so this isn't what you pay the college, uh, but this is what a budget that the college sets where you can get financial aid to pay for these types of expenses that you need covered while you're going to school. Um, so again, this is just a budget. When we talk about the student aid index, um, obviously income is a major driver of that student aid index, both the student income as well as the parent income if it's a dependent student. Assets, when we talk about assets, let me just spend just a minute on this. It's your cash, savings, checking accounts, 
uh, taxable investments. Um, so if you have a retirement account, a 401k, an IRA, a pension, you do not report retirement accounts on the FAFSA. Okay. So that part hasn't changed. Uh, and so assets is assets. Uh, if it's a retirement account, you don't count it. Uh, you do not count the value of your home. You do not count the value of your vehicles. You do not include the value of insurance. If you have a life insurance policy, um, you don't include those. You do include your taxable account. So if you have stocks, mutual funds, CDs, bonds, uh, again, cash, savings, checking, you include that in your assets. If you have a 529 plan, which is a college savings account, if it's in the student's name or the parent's name, you report the value of it for that beneficiary or for that student. If you have a 529 in multiple students, for you have multiple, uh, several children and you have a portion of the 529 divided among each child, um, you just report the, the value of the 529 in that student's portion of the 529. So you don't have to report other dependents that you might have a 529 account for. If the 529 is owned by someone else other than the parent and student, so a grandparent um, or someone else not reported on the FAFSA, you would not report that as an asset uh, on the FAFSA. You do report uh, if you have rental properties or other real estate owned, you would report the net value. And so the, ass uh, the assessed value of the home minus any debt uh, to get the net value of any other type of real estate, but not your primary residence. For first time um, this year, it's change is business. So if you own a business, you would report the net value of that business on the FAFSA. In the past, there was a limit only for those who had a business with over 100 employees. That changed this year. Now, anyone who has a small business uh, has to report the net value of it. Another change is um, farms. Uh, and so there's been a lot of back and forth on this. But if it's a family owned farm, you do not report that. And so they added the word investment farm. So an investment farm is one you do not live on and one you do not work on. Um, and so if you have a farm for whatever reason that you've invested in, but you don't work on it and you don't live on that farm, you would report the net value of it. But again, if it's a family farm, you do not report the net value of that farm. So that goes into calculation of the student aid index. Also family size, um, the age of the parent, how close you are to retirement allows you to protect a certain amount of assets uh, the closer you get uh, to retirement. So that goes is factored into the equation. So going back to, it goes to cost of attendance minus the student aid index. Cost of attendance varies from school to school. Um, student aid index is the same no matter what school you'll go to. So you're eligible for need-based financial aid. It's going to vary from school to school because the cost varies from school to school. So just be aware of that uh, as you're going through the financial aid process. So when you fill out the FAFSA, the main thing you're applying for is the federal programs, which is the federal Pell Grant, uh, Federal Supplemental Education Opportunities Grant is a block grant given to the colleges towards other Pell eligible students. It is uh, need based, it is limited funds. Um, so if you get a Pell Grant but don't has, have SEOG, you want to ask the financial aid office because it's a block grant given to the college to award to their Pell eligible students. Federal work study is a great way uh, to make some money on campus. Uh, it's part-time. It's around your class schedule. Um, it can be on campus, can be off campus. Uh, it is need-based, um, but again, on average, it's about nine hours a week uh, where you can work and either pay towards the bill or use that as spending money. The TEACH grant, for those who want to go into teacher education um, and want to teach, just be aware you have to teach four out of the first eight years um, in a low-income school in a high-need field or else you have to pay it back. And then the federal direct loan program is the largest student loan program uh, in the country. Uh, there's different types. And so for the student, there's a subsidized and an unsubsidized. Subsidized, the government pays the interest on that loan while the student's going through school. There's also unsubsidized, where it does accrue interest while the student's going through school. The subsidized and unsubsidized loans are in the student's name. Uh, they, there's no credit check. They do set annual limits. They do set aggregate limits for each academic program. Uh, and so just be aware of that. The interest rate is variable fixed. Uh, so the interest rate will vary from year to year. Any loans taken out that year, the, if the interest is fixed for the life of the loan. Uh, the student does not have to begin repayment until six months after the student is no longer enrolled. There's also a plus loan program for the parents. And so whether students can take out a Stafford loan in the student's name, the parents can also take out a direct plus loan in the parent's name. Um, so just be aware of the different programs that are out there um, and some of the federal benefits that go along with uh, the federal direct loan program.
So there's also the West Virginia Student Aid Management System. So the West Virginia Student Aid Management System is a portal through our office uh, where you can apply for state financial aid. So you can create an account and then it allows you then to apply for the Promise Scholarship to apply for our West Virginia Invest Grant and some of our other state financial aid programs. Um, and so just be aware of that as you're going through, this is one of the things you want to do is create a West Virginia Student Aid Management account. We call it West Virginia SAM account. Um, so that you can apply for state financial aid. It allows you to apply. You can edit your applications. You can view the status of your applications. You can see your award information. It allows you to submit documents uh, securely to our office. And so just a great way for you to keep your contact information updated with our office as well. One of our state financial aid programs is the West Virginia Invest Grant. This is a, for free community college in West Virginia is the last dollar in. And so it applies other federal and state and institutional scholarships and grants first, and they'll kick in and cover any other tuition and fees left over. Um, but it's a great way to get your first two years of college paid for. Um, and it covers a certificate as well as associate degree programs. There's no age limit. And so it's not just high school seniors, but we've had people even up into their 70s apply and take advantage of this program. Um, there is a requirement that you cannot have an associate degree or higher already. Or if you have 90 or more attempted college credit hours, you're not eligible. Um, but otherwise, again, um, whether high school seniors as well as adults should apply if you're looking to get some type of certificate or associate's degree. This goes through the different eligibility requirements uh, for the West Virginia Invest Grant. Um, and you can see, again, you do need to be a resident of West Virginia at least 12 months. Um, but again, it goes through the different, uh, it's not all programs at a community college, um, but it's all of our community colleges in the state of West Virginia, as well as Potomac State, which is a branch campus of WU participate um, in the invest grant. You have to fill out both the invest application as well as the FAFSA. Again, it is a rolling basis, uh, but we do encourage you to apply by April 15th of each year. Uh, and it covers both summer uh, as well as fall and spring. Um, and again, encourage you to apply as soon as possible. One of the requirements is you do have to take a drug screen uh, before this first day of class of each academic year. Um, so you, once you're once you apply and you fill out the FAFSA, it'll go to the community college. The community, community college determines whether you're eligible or not. Once they determine your eligibility, we will then send you a notice. If you're eligible, we'll give you the instructions of how to go through the drug screen process. Um, and it has to be within the 60 days prior to the first day of class. Once you take the drug screen and we get the results, we will then send you an email um, letting you know to sign a promissory note. Um, because one of the requirements is you have to live in West Virginia for two years once you're no longer enrolled. Um, and if you don't, uh, then you have to pay it back. Uh, and so it doesn't, it's not based on whether you finish the program. It's if you want to change programs, if you want to go on to a bachelor's or whatever, that's fine. The only requirement is you have to live in West Virginia for two years once you're no longer enrolled. You don't have to complete the program. Um, and so just be aware um, that the only requirement is you live in West Virginia once you're no longer enrolled. And as long as you do that, then you don't have to pay it back. One of the other requirements is you do have to complete two hours of community service each semester in which you receive the invest grant. Moving on, the West Virginia Higher Education Grant is one of our need-based grant programs. So just I know this, this is the West Virginia Invest Grant, and this is the West Virginia Higher Education Grant. Uh, and so this is different. So this is a need-based program. All you have to do is file the FAFSA each year by this year, May 1st, but generally by April 15th of each year. We'll automatically receive your FAFSA and we'll automatically determine whether you're eligible or not eligible for the Higher Education Grant. In order to be eligible for this year, a student had to have a student aid index or an EFC between zero and 13,000. We haven't set the limit for next year. We might increase that a little bit because of some of the issues with the FAFSA. Um, and so just be aware, we'll publish that sometime in the spring, what the EFC or the student aid index limit is for next year. The maximum amount you can receive is 3,300. Um, and so you can attend a West Virginia school. We also reciprocate with the state of Pennsylvania. So if you go to a school in Pennsylvania, you can receive up to $600 in the higher education grant program. One of our other grant programs is the HEAPS grant. So the West Virginia Invest grant, there's the West Virginia Higher Education grant, and then there's the HEAPS grant. Higher education grant program, there's no age limit, but it is for full-time students. The HEAPS grant 
is any age limit. Um, so you can be high school coming out of high school, or you can be an adult. You can go part time. It's a block grant that we give to our colleges in the state to award to their part time students, summer, fall, or spring. But it is limited dollars. So if you're enrolled part time, reach out to the financial aid office at your school. And here's some of the eligible requirements to be eligible for the HEAPS grant. Again, you need to do the FAFSA, and then there'll be a separate application at the college um, that you would fill out to be eligible for HEAPS. Then we have a separate program called HEAPS Workforce. Um, and so HEAPS Workforce is for short-term training programs of 12 months or less. So this would be a CDL license or uh, an LPN program, a cosmetology or HVAC, um, plumbing, um, uh, pharmacy tech, um, any type of program that would be less than 12 months at our community colleges, at our vocational schools throughout West Virginia, you can get to $2,000 to help pay for that program. Again, no age limit. Um, so all these programs up to this point, there's no age limit um, in whether high school senior or adults can qualify for these programs. Again, you need to file the FAFSA and there is a separate keeps workforce application that you would fill out. And now the Promo Scholarship. So the Promo Scholarship is the only program I've talked about so far to where it's only for high school seniors uh, coming out of high school can apply for it. Um, you do have to have a 3.0 overall and a 3.0 in your core high school courses. On the ACT, a 21 overall with a 19 in each of the four sections. If you take the SAT, it's a 1080 with at least a 510 in each section. We do super score, so we'll mix and match within each test to get your overall best score to qualify for PROMIS. As I mentioned, we've extended this deadline. Normally, it's March 1st. It's now been extended to May 1st, so you need to fill out both the PROMIS application and the FAFSA by May 1st of this year. While the application deadline is May 1st, you have until June and July to get a qualifying test score. So even though you might not have a qualifying test score right now, you still want to apply because you can take the ACT up through July, the SAT, SAT up through June, and get a qualifying score to qualify for PROMIS. But you need to have applied and fill out both the PROMIS application and the FAFSA by May 1st. So we normally will automatically get your test scores for any test taken in the state of West Virginia. Um, ACT is really good about getting us their test scores. SAT, not so much. Uh, so SAT will only send us the, uh, scores twice a year, once in January for the fall scores and then in July for the spring scores. So I really encourage you, if you take the SAT, to put our code when you register a 3456 so we will get your scores sooner. On the ACT, you don't need to put your code on there. Generally, we will get your scores um, within usually three to four weeks after you've taken the test. Well, in the SAT, I encourage you to put our code of 3456 when you register so that we can get the score sooner. Some of the other requirements for PROMIS is you do need to complete half your graduation requirements at the West Virginia High School. You also need to be a resident of West Virginia 12 months prior to applying to be eligible for PROMIS. PROMIS is tuition only. It only covers tuition and mandatory fees. We'll pay up to $5,200 a year. Uh, and so that equates to uh, $2,600 per semester. You can renew it up to four semesters for a two-year degree, up to eight semesters for a four-year degree. In order to renew it, you do not fill, have to fill out anything else to renew it. It is only based on your academic um your academic progress, right? And so after the first year you're in college, you have to have a 2.75 cumulative college GPA and complete 30 credit hours. Then thereafter, we'll look at you at the end of each year, not each semester, but each year to look to see if you have a 3.0 cumulative college GPA and if you completed 30 credit hours. A couple things on this is one is we look at your cumulative grade point average. So this would also include any dual enrolled courses that you took in high school count towards the cumulative college GPA used for renewal. And so those college credits that you might take in high school for dual enrollment can help you, but they can also hurt you if you get some poor grades uh, while doing dual enrollment. So you wanna take those dual enrollment courses seriously because they can really help you and give you a buffer uh, once you begin college. 
um, to boost up that GPA uh, before you even start. But the dual enrolled credits don't count towards the, the, the 30 credit hours. You do have to get every 12 month period. So those credits that you earn from dual enrollment count, count towards the 30 hours that you have to take every year. Having said that, if you do come into college with a lot of dual enrolled courses, you might have certain academic years in which you can't attain 30 because there's just not enough credits um, that you can take towards your degree in order to reach that 30 or to be full time. In which case we do have an appeal process you can go through um, to say, hey, I don't have enough credits towards my degree to take this semester or this year to be either be full-time or to meet the 30 hour requirement. And then we'll work with you um, if you run into that situation. So to apply for Promise, you would go to collegefordw.com, hit apply now uh, and fill out the Promise application. Um, or again, so you can link to the FAFSA as well. One of our other programs is the West Virginia STEM Scholarship. This is for students going to STEM. Health sciences don't qualify, so it's the pure STEM field. So science, technology, engineering, mathematics. If you want to go on to medical school or pharmacy schools, those don't count. Uh, it has to be a true STEM field. But you can get to $3,000. But you do have to uh, say you'll work one year full-time in the STEM field in West Virginia for each year you receive it or else you have to pay it back. It is highly competitive. It is merit-based. So we take the highest grades, the highest test scores um, in order for those students um, to see who's eligible. Um, and so it's highly competitive. We also have a nursing scholarship. Uh, and so for those who want to go into nursing, uh, just be aware uh, the application period is from April 15th to June 1st. You do have to work as a nurse in West Virginia or teach at a nursing school in West Virginia or else you have to pay it back. Uh, so be aware of that um, if you will into nursing. Be aware of the different college scholarships that are out there. Um, a lot of times they're based on grades or test scores. Some are based on need. Uh, obviously, some are performance-based like music or sports or art um, or other some type of talent. Um, just be aware of those different. Ask the colleges what type of applications uh, you might need to fill out, um, what those deadlines are, what the renewal requirements are so you can maintain those scholarships moving forward. Obviously, be aware of the private resources that are out there through the community foundations, maybe through your church denomination, through your employers. Um, for instance, if you want to be a nurse, there's a lot of hospitals that have uh, programs uh, to help you go through a nursing program in return for you working for them when you graduate. So just be aware of those different programs that are out there to help you uh, pay for college expenses. Also, as I hey, mentioned- Hey, Brian. Yes. I'm sorry. Can I interrupt you really quick? Hey, Brian. Go right ahead. We've got a We've got a question in the chat about the Underwood Smith Teaching Scholarship. Do you have any information on that? Yes, I do. Okay. So for the Underwood Smith uh, Teacher Scholarship, the, the state did not give us enough funding to make it available for the class of 2024. Everyone is aware of that. The governor's office is aware of it. The legislature is aware of it. Our indication is that when the legislative session starts here in a, a week or so, uh, one of the first items that they're going to address is the funding for Underwood Smith. So as soon as they secure the funding for the class of 2024, there's a chance that we will then be able then, uh, if they do give us that funding then for the class of 2024, we'll then make that application available for the Underwood Smith Teaching Scholars Program. Uh, but we do have to wait until we've secured the funding from the state uh, to be able to offer that. There's no sense in us having an application open when we don't have the funding to, to be able to fund it. Um, and so if you are interested in that, uh, send us an email. Um, we will put you on a list. And so once uh, the state tells us that we have the funding, we will then open up that application. Uh, we'll have a compressed uh, application cycle, probably uh, sometime from January to May. Um, we'll try and get everything in uh, so that by May 1st, we'll know who those recipients are. Um, but just be aware. Um, and if you're interested, please email us. And when we have more information, we'll share that with you via email. If you have other questions on that, put them in the chat um, and I'll be happy to answer those. Going back again, as I mentioned, this uh, five state smart 529 plan, um, anything you contribute to a 529 plan, you get a state tax deduction on your state tax return. Um, and so just be aware of that. There's also in conjunction with that, the West Virginia Jumpstart Savings Program. And this is if you have children or, or even yourself, if you're going into a field uh, that has a lot of costs in terms of tools and equipment, 
Uh, so for example, a culinary school or welding um, or even like linemen, uh, sometimes those can go into the thousands in terms of equipment and things you need for that apprenticeship um, or occupation or trade uh, that they have this jumpstart savings program where you can put money into it. Uh, anything you contribute is you get state tax deduction and any interest or earnings that you make on it is tax free if you use it uh, for those uh, purposes. Um, so just be aware of those uh, savings programs to help you pay for educational costs. Academic common market. And so if you're looking at an academic program that is not offered in the state of West Virginia, I always go to marine biology. We don't have an ocean, so we don't offer marine biology in the state of West Virginia. But we do have agreements with schools that have oceans nearby uh, where you can pay in-state tuition. Um, and so it does not impact financial aid. So it doesn't mean you can get take promise out of state or anything like that. You promise can only be used in state, but this allows you to pay in-state tuition uh, at those schools when we don't offer the academic program here in West Virginia. CFWB is our main website uh, for the college search process. So it's a great uh, portal to go to, uh, to look at different colleges, uh, to use ACT, SAT prep questions are on here. We have a free scholarship search on here. Uh, we have career planning. And so you can do a career interest survey if you're not sure what you want to go into um, or what you need to prepare in order to be, uh, if you want to be a financial aid professional like me, um, you can go in there and see what kind of background and education you need uh, for that type of occupation. So it's a great resource uh, to use for your college search process. Then the companion site, if you're just interested in state financial aid, you can go directly to collegefordubb.com in order to apply for our state financial aid programs. This is a great resource. And so if you're not already signed up, I encourage students uh, to sign up for our texting program. So we send out maybe one text a month, uh, maybe two at the most, but it'll let you know, hey, ACT and SAT deadlines for registration for the next test is coming up. Hey, have you done your FAFSA? And so we send reminders to students, not only through their senior year in high school, but through their first year in college. Um, and what it allows them to do is then to respond back to us uh, through their by text message if they have any questions um, to the point where, you know, in the past, we've had students even um, thinking about committing suicide to where they've reached out to us through this text. And we've been able to then direct them to resources at the college uh, for mental health. Um, and so it's not just for financial aid, it's for any part of the college process um, to where it's just another resource that they have to help them be successful um, and to help meet their needs as they're going through not only the college search process, but that first year in college. So encourage them. If they haven't already, you can use that QR code um, and use your camera on your phone, and then you can sign up, have your students sign up for it. Again, a great resource. If you have questions regarding the FAFSA or federal financial aid, you can call the federal financial aid hotline at 1-800-433-3243. Again, this is for the federal government. Um, and so you know how those 1-800 numbers, you know, you'll have to go through probably um, a, a call chat, you know, where you press one, press two menu, a phone tree uh, to get to someone. Um, but sometimes you have to, uh, depending on the issue you're facing. If it's a general question regarding the FAFSA or federal financial aid or state financial aid, you can call our office and I promise you'll probably get a, a person a lot quicker than you would at the federal number. And you can contact our office, 1-877-987-7664. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and so feel free to reach out to our office if you have any questions or run any of the hurdles or blocks um, as you're trying to go through this process. Uh, that's what we're here for. And then if you go onto our website or even in the communications that we send you, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's um, a chat bot where you can, um, it's a chat bot, right? It's a computer based. But if you type in live chat uh, during our office hours, Monday through Friday, eight to five, if you type in live chat, you can then communicate with our office directly with one of our staff people. Now, with the chat bot, we can answer um, personal information. So if you're needing specific student information regarding your, your account information, we can't release that through the chat, um, obviously for privacy reasons, and we can't verify your identity on the other end. And so either call us or email us. Um, but if it's a general question, feel free to use the live chat.
And you have our contact information there. Um, and so feel free, you have our phone number, you have our email address. Uh, again, you can go to collegefordw.com uh, for state financial aid or cfw.com um, and feel free to reach out to us and be happy uh, to help you any way we can. At this point, I'll turn it over. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Um, but I do appreciate your attendance tonight and I hope this was helpful to you. And we do have one question in the chat. Um, someone is asking, for the FAFSA, whose taxes do I put if the person who claimed me on their 2022 taxes is not my main financial contributor? And so when we go back to the parent, okay, um, it has nothing to do with who claims you on the 2022 taxes, all right? And so the primary question is, which parent? It, well, if it's biological, right? You have two parents, biological parents, married, living together, both their incomes go on the FAFSA, not an issue. In cases of divorce or separation, the question you're going to ask is who provides the majority of the financial support to that student? Okay. Regardless of who the student lives with, regardless of who claimed them on the taxes, who provides the majority of the financial support? Use that parent, all right? Biological parent, adoptive parent. If that parent's then remarried, it's the parent and step parent that then goes on the FAFSA. If that parent is single, just divorced, separated, not remarried, it's just the one parent that goes on the FAFSA. I don't know if I had answered the question or not, um, but again, it's the parent that provides the majority of the financial support. Okay, I'll, I'll so if you... I'll be even, sorry, uh, Emily, read it one more thing. It, it's not a grandparent. It's not an aunt. It's not an uncle. It always reverts back to the biological adoptive parent. Even if they don't live with them, they still have to. That's the information they have to report as the biological adoptive parent, even if they live with a grandparent, unless the, unless the grandparent has adopted them. Sorry, Emily. You're OK. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, if it didn't pop something else in the chat, um, you do have another question. It says for some for some scholarships. I think that might be more for the TGKVF scholarships. I think that might be for us. Unless you think that makes you think of something, Brian, you're welcome to answer. <laughs> I didn't see, uh, can you repeat the question? I didn't catch that. I believe this person is asking about scholarship requirements. Um, it sounds like it is, Katie. So this person is asking for some of the scholarships. It says the requirements are graduate students. Does that mean college, graduate, high school, or only or both? Uh, uh, also, from my perspective, when we talk about graduate students, it means someone already has a bachelor's four-year college degree um, and it's for a master's professional program after a bachelor's degree program. And that would be the same for us, too. If it says it's a fund for graduate students, it would be that you already have a four-year degree or a bachelor's degree. Again, any other questions? So say if anyone has any questions, feel free to email us um, and we'll be happy to answer those if you think of something later on. But thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us, Brian. And thank you all for your questions. Brian is a master at answering questions. Okay, so welcome to the TGKBF portion of our session tonight. Um, we are going to be talking, as I said, more about uh, the Greater Canal Valley Scholarships in general. So I always like to start with a broad overview of what our scholarship program is. And as you'll see in um, our scholarship catalog on our website, we have over 100 funds that are available. And those funds come about because a generous person in our community, connected to our community, beyond our community, starts a fund and has a desire to support education in our area. So uh, once they've created that, they get to decide. Again, we were talking about those specific criteria for a fund. So that may be something like, is the scholarship intended for college, university, trade school? Is it for an undergraduate or graduate or maybe even both? Is financial need a factor in this scholarship? Is it renewable? So that means if you get it your freshman year, are you able to continue to apply for it maybe through graduate school and, I'm sorry, undergrad and graduate school? If it's not renewable, then you can apply. We can get into that later, but then you can apply for a new fund this upcoming year. Um, do you need to be a graduate of a certain high school? Did you need to play a certain sport? Do you have to have a certain um, character trait to receive this scholarship? They, so they set all of those things up. 
once it's created and ready to be distributed, we list it as available and then you are able to apply for it. So a little bit of an overview of our program. And in this portion of the presentation, I like to kind of talk about some myths maybe that are thought about as for TGKBS program. And I would say the greatest one and people I talk to all the time don't realize that our scholarship program is for a statewide audience. As long as you are a West Virginia resident, you are eligible to apply for a scholarship um, that, that is beyond our six county area. Um, another thing is a lot of people think that our scholarships are only for a four-year degree when, in fact, we have some that are open to four-year degree and VOTEC. We have some that are just VOTEC, again, graduate school, nursing school, um, so they can be as broad or niche, but um, we have things beyond a four-year degree. We have scholarships that range from $1,000 to $12,000. Uh, the $12,000, because everyone who sees that number loves to ask me what scholarship is worth $12,000, and that is the graduate award level for the Marmette scholarship. So if you know someone who's going to be studying conservation, um, oh goodness, geology, you can check out more of the criteria again in that scholarship catalog. But that's where that $12,000 uh, mark is going to be. But our average award is $3,145 a year. So that is a substantial um, amount of support for a student. Last year, as Dr. Foster said, when we started the presentation, we awarded over $1.5 million um, last school year to over 480 students. It was a record year for us. We were so incredibly grateful to be able to assist that many students. And each of those students uh, was awarded one scholarship because when you go to fill out your application, you can fill out to apply for two scholarships. You are only going to be able to be awarded one scholarship plus the TGKBF scholars, if applicable. We'll talk about that in a second. But once you submit that application, you can select two different funds. And again, uh, if you are chosen by both committees, they think you are both worthy of the scholarship that they, you applied for, then you are only able to receive one. Now, like I said, that is TGKBF Scholars. That is a unique scholarship fund that we offer here at the foundation. It is a scholarship fund available to our six county region. And that's often where that uh, miscommunication comes in that our scholarship program is only for our six surrounding counties. That is our grants program. So, uh, but those TGKBF counties, which are Boone, Clay, Fayette, Kanawha, Lincoln, and Putnam. If your student lives, it has to be a graduating senior, so a senior, current high school senior who is going to be going into college in the fall, and they live in one of those six counties, they are eligible to apply for the TGKBF scholars. It is a more rigorous um, fund. You can again see that criteria in the scholarship catalog. If you look at the available scholarships on our website, that's where you can find that. But it is one that can be applied for in addition to the two and you can receive it in addition to the two baselines. Um, and then finally, we have the uh, Tallheimer Supplemental Scholarship, which is a fund that is available only to students who receive one of those baseline scholarships and then they are eligible to apply for that. One thing I like to go over is the program timeline. So as you know, our application is now live and open on our website. And typically, historically, our application has closed on February the 1st. But because of the FAFSA this year, we have extended that deadline until February the 15th. So that's the magic date you want to have that application submitted. If you've started the application and saved it, it is not considered eligible to go on to the review portion of the program if you do not, um, I'm sorry, fully submit that until February 15th. So once we receive all of those scholarships, it is all um, on the back end here. We'll enter those into a database, get those to our volunteer reviewers. They review the funds, select their recipients, and then uh, we like to notify you all typically around the first week of May. I'm asking for a little bit of give or take this year because again, that FAFSA is ever changing um, of the status of that, but typically it is around the first week of May that we send you an award letter in your email. That's very important and will come through DocuSign. 
Again, if you are awarded an award, it will come through DocuSign. You submit that, and then once we receive that, we send our scholarship checks directly to your university. The check will not come to your door. It will go straight to your university, and your school will separate that between um, evenly between your fall semester and your spring semester. So a few tips when the, you are choosing the right fund for you. I recommend to go to our website, click that available scholarships link and print out a copy of the scholarship catalog. And I love to always talk about um, when I was younger, we would go through the catalog and circle what we wanted for Christmas. And I tell you, receiving a scholarship feels a lot like the excitement of Christmas. So you wanna go through maybe uh, look at all the eligibility and criteria of the different funds, circle the ones that you think that you um, meet the eligibility and criteria for. And then once you go through, you want to also look at maybe the amount of awards that were granted last year. In comparison to other funds, you may want to look at the dollars that were awarded and just kind of compare those to one another and see which one that you think you might want. So you'll also want to go ahead and gather the materials and information that are needed to apply for our scholarships. And those would be your required personal essay. And I always encourage students to make this personal essay the, the heartbeat of their application. Tell us something really unique about yourself. Um, make yourself stand out to that reviewer. Some of our reviewers are reviewing up to 25 applications. So make yourself stand out on that personal essay and have someone trusted edit and review that for you so that you know when they go to read it, you are just presenting your best self. The second you'll need are those FAFSA results. Oh my goodness. So we are accepting the estimated FAFSA results for this year, which I have been told by a few students who said that they were able to complete their applications already, <laughs> excuse me, that those come straight to your email as soon as you hit submit. So that is a wonderful thing. Those are the results that we um, are willing to accept and are looking for in the application. If you choose to complete your TGKBF application prior to receiving those results, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, um, you will need to fill out the document placeholder that we have included in the application. And what that placeholder is going to say is, I recognize that if I'm submitting this as a placeholder, then I must submit my FAFSA results to my email, kfarrell at tgkbf.org. Um, it will be in the chat at the end of the presentation. But you will need to send that those FAFSA results to my email by the February 15th deadline. And then I will attach that to your application on the back end. You'll also want to have the information that you need. You'll want to have your two funds selected and any required essays for those funds. So as you'll see in that eligibility and criteria, and Megan dropped the link to the catalog. Thank you so much, Megan. You can find that in the chat. If you click on that, you'll see that eligibility and criteria. And some of those, as the Marmette essay that I mentioned earlier, have a specific essay that you must fill out to um, for those specific scholarships. You're also going to want a copy of your latest grades. If you are a student who is a current recipient and you are renewing for this year, that will be your fall 2023 grades that you will upload to apply for your scholarship for the next academic year. That's been a common question I've been getting lately. Um, for students in high school, you can go ahead and you don't need your official grades yet. Give us what you have now. That will be absolutely fine as in the fall 2023 grades. You'll also need your household income and some other income information. You'll need your a ACT or SAT scores if you have them. If you don't, that's okay. But once you submit that application, whatever your ACT, SAT at the time uh, is at the time, that is what's going to come through to us. You'll need a list of your extracurricular activities and jobs. List everything from volunteer opportunities to where you have worked, where you do work, maybe a little bit of what you did there, uh, just to show your involvement in the community. You'll want to um, have your list of awards and honors. Again, anything to make you stand out, anything that you received. You'll need financial information such as stocks, bonds, college saving plans, and a student ID number if you have one. If you do not, that's okay. Don't worry. You don't need to have one just yet, but you will need one before we can award you a scholarship. So once you get that student ID, you can again email me and I will get that um, attached to your application. And then remember, you can submit one application um, one application allows you to apply for two funds plus the TG, TGKBF scholars if it's applicable. 
Hey, Katie. Yes. You have a question in the chat. Um, oh, someone okay. is asking, in regards to household income financial information, does the same rule apply as the state federal application when it comes to legal guardianship, meaning it would only be the student's financial information, not the guardian as well? That is an excellent question. I don't think that I have been asked that question before. I have the chat up. Let me read it and be a little, get a little more clear on it. That is a great question. Um, if you would, Jessica, would you send me an email? Uh, it will be at the, on the last slide of this presentation. It'll also be in the chat. I think we, you may have it already too. If you'll send me an email, I'll look into that. And then um, that is an excellent question. Thank you so much. Oh, Stephanie dropped it in there. Thank you so much. So and, I guess, thank you, Emily. I'm curious as to the, so we're saying that um, household income would be everyone in the household for us, correct? Yes. Um, so the question I, is, so if it's a because the student wouldn't have any financial Wh whoever put this this question in could you get on get on um unmute yourself and um or could do we have to unmute so so that we can get some clarity as to this question it, it, it's jessica hudson sorry um i had legal guardianship of my nephew but i know with the last presentation as it was you know in regards to um the state and federal application talking about dependency and non-dependency one of the qualifiers for dependency was that they were um in foster care someone had legal guardianship of them so it wasn't a parent it wasn't a parent but someone had someone other than the parent had legal guardianship so if that was the case and they were considered a dependent and only their financial information was to be included on their, um, on the FAFSA and, you know, any kind of state or federal application. So that's why I was asking in terms of the financial information or if they were legally emancipated, something like that. So I guess my question is when it, in regards to this application in particular, since it was different for the, you know, federal application, if it would be only the student's financial information included in this or. I'm just thinking, what so whatever household, because the FAFSA would have household income, correct? So whatever, um, and, and let's kind of take, if you could close, if you could stop sharing for a minute, Katie. Sure. Um, I'm thinking whatever household income is um, is entered into the FAFSA, that should be just can be consistent with whatever that is across the board. Okay, so so Brian then said it would only be if they if someone had legal guardianship over them, then they would be considered a dependent, and it would only be the student filling out the FAFSA. It would only be their information. So I guess what you're saying is, for this, it would be consistent with that, and it yeah, would only be the students. Be okay. With that. Yeah, be consistent. Okay, perfect. Whatever, because we're all using the FAFSA, and we want to make right. sure that everything aligns. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Great question, though. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Foster. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once you submit that application, this is another question that I get a lot, is what happens next? You submit it in February, and then you may not hear from us um, until, until May. So you will get a confirmation email stating that your application was submitted. You will get an award or decl declination letter around the first week of May. Again, we ask for a little bit of lenience there as the FAFSA situation continues to all evolve every day. If you are selected as a recipient, so our committee has looked at your application, they've decided that they would like to award you a scholarship, you will receive a digital award letter sent to your email via DocuSign. You'll get a check sent again to that full amount for your scholarship sent directly to your school. Uh, another question that I often get that you might want to put in your memory bank, should you receive a scholarship from us for this year? 
is uh, if you receive a scholarship at the fall, kind of this time of year next year, you do not need to send us anything to renew for the spring 2025 semester. The application that you will fill out next fall is for the following academic year. So we work a little bit ahead of schedule um, here at the foundation. And then um, you are responsible. This is really important. Should you receive um, a scholarship from us or should you be a current recipient and you transfer, you get a new student ID, you need to let me know, you need to email me because your scholarship will not automatically transfer. If you don't let me know, I won't know to change you in our system and send you another, uh, a new scholarship to your new school. And some FAQs and reminders. So if you have filled out an application with us before, you will know that we used to ask for your tax forms. That's no longer going to be a requirement for the application. And all application um, documents must be submitted in a PDF format that is the easiest for our viewers to see and for us to process. So we would appreciate that. Uh, the FAFSA placeholder, again, can be found inside of the application, and we will be accepting estimated SAI results. Uh, they're not usually far different from the actual results. And again, I believe those are now slated to not be um, to you until sometime in February. Uh, the application can be saved and returned to. So when you start your application, you can create an account and save that application and return to it so that you don't have to sit and fill it out all in one, um, one fell swoop. Uh, another important thing, renewals are prioritized. So if you submit a renewal application, you cannot submit a new application. So this is more uh, targeted to our current recipients, which I know there were a few of you on the call. Thank you for coming. If you are currently a TGKVF scholarship holder and your scholarship is considered renewable, you need to fill out a renewal application if you would like to continue to stay prioritized for that scholarship. You can fill out a new application and select those two funds and start over, but you will be in with all of the new applicants. Um, your application will not be prioritized. Again, a reminder, because if uh, I know we have some counselors who have joined us today, again, thank you for coming. You are probably used to and you've received some um, documentation, some handouts that say the first. All of our materials were printed before we decided to extend that deadline. So if you see February 1st anywhere, please know that for this year, the deadline has been extended to February 15th. And we do not submit, I mean, I'm sorry, we do not accept late submissions. Again, remember, some scholarships are renewable and some are non-renewable, but that's going to be really important to look at that criteria and that eligibility and consider when you are applying. Remember, you can only receive one of the funds that you applied for with that exception of the TGKBF scholars and your application. Again, remember, your application is not considered complete until you've submitted FAFSA results. So whether that be you get those estimated SAI results in and you submit those with your application on the initial round, or if you fill out that document placeholder, you need to submit those results to me via email by, again, that February 15th deadline. And we'll open it up for some questions now if they, you all have any more. And here is um, any of the information that you might um, need. You are always welcome to email or call me. I am always, always happy to chat and answer questions that you might have. And thank you. It looks like Emily has dropped that information in the chat. Thank you so much, Emily. Yep, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat just yet. So if you have questions, throw those in there. And again, all of these materials can be found on our website. If you go to that scholarships tab, you'll find the um, application, the renewal application. You will find some FAQs. You will find the scholarship catalog. I will note that our information on the, um, I have forgotten the, the portion of the website name. We can pull that up really quickly. We will pull up the website very quickly. Me Megan shared the scholarship information um, link. Oh, thank you, Megan. Okay. 
If you look at our website here, you can go to available scholarships. And the quick reference guide, that's the term I could not remember, the quick reference guide. Now I will say these are in the process of being updated. So uh, for the most up-to-date criteria and eligibility, you'll wanna click again that full list of scholarships or that will take you, the link that Megan dropped in the chat will take you there. And then if you go to how to apply, there is also a scholarship application walkthrough right here. So if you are like me and you'd like to have a little bit of an idea of what that application might look like before you go to um, fill out yours, you can play this. There are a few changes because this was for the 2023 application, but they are very, very similar. Candace, our grants manager, she will walk you straight through that. And then if you have forgotten anything and you um, would rather check the website, then give me a call or an email. There are lots of FAQs here. And then again, that main scholarship page where you'll find the link to start your applications. Sounds great. Wonderful job, Katie. And um, is Brian still on or did he, he probably hopped off, has a full schedule. But um, it's, thank you so much. You did an excellent job. And just so everyone, there are some other team members on the line. Emily, who was expertly managing the chat. Emily's our program associate. She supports scholarships as well as grants. We've got Megan Simpson. Show your face, Megan. Megan Simpson is <laughs> our program director. We've got our chief program officer, Stephanie Heyer. Um, I'm trying to see Jane Powell is our communications director. And I think that's... <laughs> she's, Jane she's, gave a, <laughs> she doesn't have a camera, so she gave a wave. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Reach out to Katie or, or to Emily if you have any questions about your application. And, you know, spread the word. We've got lots of money and we want to make sure we get it all out. Okay. Thank have you all so much for coming. Have a wonderful evening.